All right, so today we are talking about matter. Like I said, we're going to stop for just a little while talking about math. We're not going to be doing much math today at all, and we won't do math probably until Thursday. And so if you look at your schedule, just kind of a reminder to be on the ball looking at your schedule. Today is the 30th, um, Thursday's the 1st, then we have one more lecture next Tuesday before your exam next Thursday. So we basically have a little less than two weeks before your next, before your exam. And if you also notice that your homework too is due on, and that's a mistake. Or I'm, I apologize, I just, I just told you wrong. You actually have two full weeks. Your exam is not until the Tuesday the 13th. So you actually have a full two weeks, my bad. So you have a full two weeks before your exam. So your homework is due on Sunday evening. Most all of your homeworks, except for the very last homework, are always due on a Sunday evening, okay? And someone made the comment to me the other day, well, this is not right. Math makes all their homeworks due at midnight or 11 o'clock. Why can't you do that? Well, I don't. And I don't do it because I go to bed before 11 o'clock. And many of you need to. Now, I can't make you go to bed, but I can say your homework has to be done by 9. So that hopefully gets it done instead of you waiting until midnight to do it. So... Uh, Hopefully you get it done by then. I think there was only one student who actually did not get their homework done at all, didn't even start on it. Let me rephrase it. There was only one student who didn't even start on their homework. Otherwise, everybody at least started on it. So good job. Thank you. Thank you for starting on your homework. Now, this time around, my suggestion is start on your homework now and do a little bit every day. That way, if something happens next week and you don't get to do any of your homework, then you at least get partial credit. For those people who tend to wait to the last minute and say, oh, I can do that later, things happen. So just be aware of that and try to get your homework a little bit done every day and that will help you, okay? Also, last thing, and then I'll quit talking about business stuff. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. I, I know I've sent the email. But on your Blackboard site, under extra practice homework problems, there is a set of problems that are paper worksheets with with answer keys that are listed test one it says something like test one material or test one worksheets or something like that that was actually from another class that i taught that's almost identical to this class but in that class i don't do online homework i actually didn't grade their homework they just had it so that's for you all too so there's more than enough practice for you all to do and so you've got the paper homework. Obviously, I know some of you may have noticed you cannot access the Achieve homework once it's submitted or once the deadline is passed, you can't look at it again. And that the homework that's paper homework was in answer to that question, can we open that up again? And I said, no, but here's some paper homework for you to practice. And so there are my problems on the paper homework, which is more like what you're gonna see on an exam. And so that should help, hopefully. All right, matter. You've been talking about matter since you were a little bitty, I assume. Um, in elementary school, usually in kindergarten or first grade, they start talking about matter. What I've discovered it by substitute teaching, though, in elementary school, and I don't know how your school was, but unfortunately, it seems like what I'm discovering is you might learn something in one class, and then for five years, you never revisit it. And then, and, and I, the answer I'm getting on that, well, we don't test for that in this grade. And I'm like, ah, this is not about a test. This is about life. This is about understanding these things. And so that, I think that answered my question, though. Why do my college students not remember this stuff? Why are they not getting this when they had it in elementary school? And the problem was you probably only had it once, and you never revisited it. So I'm learning by te substitute teaching. I'm learning how things were because I homeschooled my kids. I didn't do what you all did, and so for many of you. And so it's a little different for you all than what I would have expected. So now I'm, I'm learning to have a little more grace when I say, why don't you know this? Because you were taught when you were five or 10 maybe at the most. So matter, I hope you know this one. What's matter? That's exactly right. Anything that has mass and takes up space, that's what matter is. 
And so matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. All right, so is this phone matter? This phone is matter, good. So the phone is matter, how, how do I know? How do I know that this, it has mass, I can feel its mass and what? It takes up space. All right, what about um, this napkin? Is this napkin matter? Yes, this napkin is matter. How do I know? It has some kind of mass. It has a little bit of mass, that's right. Does it have as much mass as the phone? No. Does it take up some space? Does it take up as much space as the phone, though? But does it still matter? Yeah. Okay, all right. So what about the water that's in my water bottle? Is it, ma does, is it matter? Yes, does it have mass and take up space? Yes, it takes up the space of this container and it is heavier than it was when it was empty, so it has some mass, all right? What about, what about the breath that's coming out of my mouth? Is that matter? Yes, that's matter. Now, does it seem like it has mass? No, it doesn't seem like it has mass. Does it seem necessarily like it takes up space? Not necessarily. How, what's the evidence? What's something that you can do that's evidence that it takes up space? More than that. Something you, say it. Airplane. Airplane, but you're going, honestly, that's a hard concept. A balloon, I'm thinking something super simple, a balloon. Can you blow up a balloon with the breath coming out of your mouth? Yes. Well, but it still has mass, and it definitely, you showing it takes up space, right? You're definitely showing that it takes up space when you do that, okay? So I think you have an idea that solids, <coughs> liquids, and, all, and gases all have mass and take up space, so they are all what? Matter, they are all matter. All right, now my question for you is, are you matter? Yes, yeah, you're a matter. How do you know you're matter? You have mass and you take up space, okay? All right, so here's my big question for you. Do you matter? That is a joke. Thank you, Lucas, that's a joke. What's the real answer for that? Yes, 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 okay. This is your psychology class for the day, okay? Do you matter? Come on, guys, you're not very convincing. Do you matter? Yes. yes. Now, why do I say this? Why do I even bother? I'm a chemistry teacher, for crying out loud. I'm supposed to be hardcore. You know, why do I bother saying this? Because I want to tell you the truth. If you haven't ever felt like digging a hole and crawling in and never coming out again because you don't matter and nobody cares, I hate to tell you, but one day you might feel that way. Because life stinks sometimes. <laughs> and if you haven't felt that way, then hallelujah, I'm tickled to death that you've never felt that way, and I hope you never do feel that way, because it's a terrible place to be. But if you ever feel that way in the future, it might be after you get your first test back. That's a joke. Yeah. I hope. I hope that's a joke. <laughs> What are you going to say? And this is the corniest thing, but I've been telling my students this for years. I want you to look in the mirror, and I want you to say, you are matter, and you, what? Matter. Do matter. You are a big old hunk of matter, and you do matter. It might be through tears in your eyes, but you're looking in that mirror, and you say, you do matter, and, and, I'm, and I'm a big piece of matter. And you just you cry it all, and you pretend you go dig your hole and eat worms and put some ketchup on them. I don't care. But don't forget you matter, okay? One of the things you may have noticed in my syllabus, and I've started doing this when I came back. I, I used to give this information out before I left, but I started doing it, putting it in the syllabus when I came back. I've discovered over the years, students have so many troubles. People have so many troubles. Life is hard. And I encourage you to get help if you need help. 
There is no shame in going to a counselor. And, and I know Western's Counseling Center is so hard to get into. That's why I listed some other services for you on your syllabus to get help if you need it. Because nobody should have to go through something and feel like that alone. Okay, so if you're struggling right now, get some help. Talk to me if you need to, you know, I can lead, I can kind of give you some direction where you might go to get some help. But I do want everybody to know you do matter. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that you do matter, no matter what happens in life. So don't ever forget that. So, all right, you're taking some notes here. Matter, anything that has mass and takes up space. And you've already talked about solid, liquid, and gas. So those are the phases or states of matter. Now what we are going to spend a lot of time doing today, and it's going to seem a little maybe dis, maybe not like it should be. It's going to be a little maybe a, dis, uncomfortable for you because we're going to go in all different directions. But let me explain. How many of you could label yourself as a student? Everyone should raise their hand, right? Everyone should raise their hand. All right? Can you label yourself as blue eyes? You can label yourself as blue eyes, raise your hand. Can you label yourself as um, boot wearing versus tennis shoe wearing? You might label themselves as that, okay? Can you label yourself as a farmer? You may label themselves as a farmer, okay? Can you label yourself as a son? I can't label myself as a son. Can you label yourself as a daughter? Everyone in here is either a son or a daughter, okay? Can you label yourself as a parent? You may label themselves as a parent, okay? A couple of you. Can you label yourself as, um, let's see, red hair? You may label themselves as original red hair, <laughs> I should say. All right. Um, what about part of AGR? Anybody can label themselves as part of AGR? Is there not an AGR chapter? Nobody in this room. Okay, one person? I thought, wow. Anybody labeled with farmhouse? What? Goodness, that's unusual. Wow, that's very unusual. Anybody in a sorority? Couple of you? Wow, this is unbelievable. That's cool though. All right. Um, so my point being, or actually, who's employed? Let yourself as employed. Okay, all right. So what we just did is we classified you. Are you matter? Yes? Did we classify you? So sometimes we can classify people as to their, um, whether they have a job or not. We can classify you of whether you're a student or not. We can classify you in your family status. I didn't go through married, unmarried, I didn't go through all that, dating, not dating. There's all kinds of ways we can classify ourselves. If I had a classification for me, I can't classify myself as one type of matter. One day I might be wearing a farm hat. The next minute I might be wearing a teacher hat. The next minute I might be wearing a mother hat. The next minute I might be wearing a substitute teacher hat. And even when I go substitute, sometimes I'm supposed to be this person, and they say, no, I need you to be this person. So it's like I have this hat on my head constantly that's just spinning, and then it stops at who I am at that moment. You ever felt that way? Some of you probably felt that way when you've got all kinds of jobs that you've got to do. Well, if we as human beings who are matter can be classified so many different ways, then would it stand to reason that all matter can be classified many, many different ways? Does that make sense? So what we are doing is we are going to talk about some. By no means are we going to talk about all the ways that matter can be classified. So one way is the phase or the state. That means the same thing, solid, liquid, and gas. Now, most of you already know this, so I'm going to kind of run through this rather quickly. Solids will have a definite what? Definite shape and definite what? Volume. Say it one more time. Volume. volume. Very good. Definite shape and definite volume. They have a definite shape and definite volume. Now we're going to talk about something else in this space, but let's skip now to <coughs> liquids. So solids have a definite shape and a definite volume. Liquids are what? Definite what? Definite volume. 
They have a definite volume, but not definite shape. That's right. Definite volume, but not, whoop, but not, yeah, that was right, but not definite shape, okay? And a gas is what? Tell me about a gas. It has no definite shape or definite volume. No definite shape or definite volume. No definite shape, no definite volume. <clears throat> Takes on shape and volume of the container. It takes on the shape and volume of the container. You know that because if I were to have eaten a lot of beans last night and let it rip up here, and it's a really, really good one, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? It's going to stink. I'm going to smell it first, and then gradually it's going to dissipate to the room. Now, it would have to be really, 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 really good for all of you to smell it. But what does that tell us? Even if the front row smells it, what's that telling us that the gas is doing? Filling the room. Filling the room. Now, what was the volume of my gas before it left my body? We don't know specifically, but give me an idea. Of wh where was it? Come on, what's, what's your, come on, let's learn a little anatomy here. Was it in my large intestine? Was it in my large intestine before it left? And then, so is my large intestine's volume as big as this room? Now, let's think about this for a minute. Do you feel the pressure before you let one out? Why do you feel that pressure? Because that space is what? Too small. small, too small, exactly. That space is too small, and so it needs to come out. And so you let it out. Don't y'all look at me like you never gas. Come on, give me a break. If you don't, I... I'm amazed. I mean, really, I don't know how you do it. But that's what happens. That's what happens. You feel the pressure, and it's got to go somewhere. My dad is, is dead now, but my dad was hilarious. My dad, when we would be going down, I remember just vacations when I was a little girl. We'd be going down the road in our station wagon, and he'd be driving along. All of a sudden, you'd see him. He'd go like this. And you knew what was coming, and we'd be like rolling the windows down because you knew what was going to happen. And my mom would get so mad at him, and he'd go, I'm going to blow up. If I don't, I'm just going to blow up. <laughs> and my dad was just, he was a non-confrontational, super just sweet guy, but he would, he would always say, I'm going to blow up if I don't do it. And one time when he was getting older, he had, he had dementia when he was getting older, and I, would, I took care of him a lot. He died in... Um, he died in 21. I retired, and then he died in September. But um, he had dementia, and I helped take care of him a lot. But he, when, when he was not quite to the point of dying, obviously, he was still, but he was demented still some. And I don't remember one time we were out together, and I said, Daddy, I'm sorry. I got gas. He said, let her rip, let her rip. And he, that was just how he was. And so he did. He, he felt like he was going to blow up if it didn't come out. And that's, you know what I'm talking about. You feel like you're going to blow up. Well, why? Because of the pressure. Because that's space. And so it comes out, and then what does it do? It goes into the volume of the room. It goes into the volume of the room. That's why when you see these shows and these movies where people are killing people with, in the real life, when people are killed with gas, how can they be killed with gas? How can whole it's groups different. of people? Because what does the gas do? It dissipates into the entire room. It dissipates in the entire room. And so you know these things. All right, but you probably don't know, potentially, maybe you haven't thought about it yet, is tell me, put your phone up. Maybe this is not my most exciting lecture, but put your phone up, okay? Up, all the way up, all the way up. All right. Okay, so tell me which one of these, solid, liquid, and gas, have the most energy. Solid, liquid, or gas, which of those have the most energy? Gas. Gas has the most energy. 
Yeah. Which one has the slowest moving particles? Solid. solid. Okay. Now, we often think of solids as not moving at all, but is that true? Uh, no. no, that's not true. They do still move. Okay, so now then, let's talk about two different solids that you are probably not familiar with. Crystalline and amorphous. So crystalline solids, this is two words you may have never heard of. You may have heard of the words, but you didn't really know what they meant regarding solids. And so we actually have two different solids, crystalline and amorphous. Crystalline solids exist in regular repeating 3D patterns. Regular repeating 3D patterns. And amorphous solids don't have regular repeating. So crystalline have those regular repeating patterns. Lip, or I'm sorry, amorphous do not have the regular repeating patterns. What do you think an example of a crystalline solid would be? Think about things you've seen in nature. I mean, sodium. Salt. Let's call, it, let's call it table salt. Not sodium, but table salt. Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride table salt is a crystalline solid. So table salt, which is sodium chloride, is a crystalline solid. What's something in nature? What's something else you've seen in nature? Go out in the woods, go out in your fields. What have you seen? <clears throat> you ever seen little pieces of quartz? You've seen the inside like of a geode? You know what I'm talking about? That is a crystalline solid. That would be a crystalline solid. So quartz, your metals are also crystalline solids. Now, sometimes people get a little confused on metals because they think, well, can't that be melted? Sure, every solid, if you can reach the melting point, can be melted. Every solid can be melted. Every solid can be. Every solid can turn into a gas if you go past the melting and get into the gas phase. But sometimes we can't do that because of temperature-wise. It's hard to get to that point. Now, amorphous means, the definition of the word amorphous means without shape or form. Amorphous means without shape or form. So what would an amorphous solid be? Think about solids that you know of that you sometimes think, is that solid or a liquid or what is that really? What's something that you may have seen? I'll give you a hint, it's something you eat. Some people eat. It was a school lunch a long time ago food. I don't know that you had it for school lunch. Jello. Jello. Jello is one. Jello is an amorphous solid. Jello is an amorphous solid because you look at that jello and you don't know is it a solid? It's, it's wet. It wiggles, it jiggles, but what is it? And that is an amorphous solid. Gels. Gels are also amorphous solids. Gels are also amorphous solids. Plastics, many of your plastics, most of your plastics are going to be amorphous solids. And then the one that nobody ever understands is glass. Glass, and this is the one thing I'm really kind of teaching you here. Glass is an amorphous solid. Glass is an amorphous solid. So how do we know that glass is an amorphous solid? Glass seems like we might say it would be crystalline. Well, well, well yeah, you basically melt sand. No, we're not talking about melting. That's what, I, that's what I'm saying. We're not talking about melting. All the solids can be melted. I want to give you a hint. Go to an old building. Go look down Chestnut Street or State Street. Walk along and look at the old buildings and look at their glass. Say it again? Well, that's just, that's just called a divided glass window. That's, that's not, but look at the glass itself. Look at, say it again? Shattered, broken? Well, no, I mean, all glass could break. 
Look through it. Somebody lives in an old house and they've noticed this. What do you see when you look through an old window? And you can even see it from the street. Bubbles to a certain extent, but more than even bubbles. But bubbles is part of it. Say it. Somebody's. It's wavy. It's wavy. It's wavy. Have you, and you can walk, literally, you can walk down the street. You could walk down the street right now. Go down State Street, go down Chestnut Street, and you can stand there and look at those divided light windows like you're talking about. Look at those different panes, and you'll be like, you know what, they replaced that window right there, but that, those are all old, old windows. How do you know? Because the old ones are what? Distorted. The old ones are wavy and distorted and some bubbles in them. But the brand new one or the newer one is just... Clear, no troubles, no distortions at all. What does that tell you that glass is doing? That literally is showing by evidence of time. Moving. It's moving. It's moving. The glass is, so did we already say that all solid particles move? But do we feel like they move? Does it seem like they move? No. But glass is an amorphous solid, so it does not have that crystalline structure that keeps it in place. I mean, think about geodes, think about rocks. Are they old? <coughs> Do they look the same today and tomorrow and 300 years from now? Does inside of that, it does, it looks the same. But a 300 year old piece of glass is literally going to be thicker at the bottom than it is at the top. And you say, that's crazy, I'm, read about it. Go online, y'all go online all the time. Go online, read about it. Old, old glass is thicker at the bottom than it is at the top. Now, why do we not see that often that it actually is difference in thickness? Because what often happens before it gets to that point? It breaks. <coughs> but as far as the waviness, you can see it. Go down State Street, you can see it and you'll see what I'm talking about. So that's, that is kind of like evidence that we know. So those are the three types of solid, or three types of matter, three states rather. Let me reuse that proper term. States or phases, those are the three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And then know those two phases of actual solids. Now, grab a periodic table. Has anybody got some blank periodic tables? Hopefully you've printed one out. If not, use any periodic table you have. Hopefully you've printed one out. I probably should have brought some, but I did not do it. Does everybody have a periodic table they can use? Or a friend who can, um, you've got to do some labeling. Has everybody got a periodic table? Who does not have a periodic table? Anybody got any extras? we got three or four people. Anybody got extra periodic tables they can borrow? This one's marked off, is that okay? Yeah. See if somebody can borrow it. Anybody need that one? Come get it. Come get it. If you need it, come get it. Come get it. Y'all come get it from her. Don't make her move. She's the one offering it to you. Thank you. Who else needs one? Does everybody else have one? At least something that's got, it can have marks on it. Does everybody have one that they can mark? All right. Okay. What we are going to do is we are going to label the periodic table with lots of different things right now. And this periodic table is pretty labeled, okay? I'm going to go through it and tell you what to mark first so that you don't get super confused, okay? <coughs> Fine, bromine, do exactly what I'm telling you to do. If you, if you Try to do what everything's on here, you're gonna get confused. Do only the ones I'm telling you to start with. Do bromine and mercury. Do bromine and mercury. I tell you what, let me ask this question, let me ask this. How many of you do not have, are most of the periodic tables out there the ones with lines in them? Okay, let, let me, we're gonna do this later. That's your be able to read this later. So let, let, we'll come back to that. Let's keep going. I'll come back to labeling in a minute. Sorry, but I, and I should have brought some and I, or told you to print them and that was my fault. Here, let's keep going. We'll come back. We'll come back at the end of class and I'll run and get some periodic tables 
and we'll label everything at one time and that'll save us time right now because then you, you're not going to be able to read it if you put it on that one. All right, let's go to another type of um, matter. We're going to, so we, so our big picture here is matter, anything that has mass and takes up space, phases of matter, what are the three phases of matter? Solid, liquid, and gas. The phases of matter are solid, liquid, and gas. And now we're looking at specifically just elements for a minute. And we're saying what kind of elements are there? What types of elements are there? And there are metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. What do we know about metals? Conduct, wow, say that again. Conductors, that's usually not the first one they say, but that's good. Conductors of what? Conductors of heat and electricity. Conductors of heat and electricity. Conductors of heat and electricity. How do you know that they conduct heat? What's something that you use in your house that you know they conduct heat? Say it again. An oven. An oven, but what's, what do you put in the oven? What kind of... Metal pans on your stovetop, what are you using usually? Not always, you sometimes do use glass, but what do we often use? Metal pans. What, have you ever stirred with a metal spoon and you leave your metal spoon in there and forget? It's hot. It's hot. Why did it get hotter faster than the water did? Because it conducts heat. And we're going to get to the other reason why later, and that's called specific heat. But we'll get to that at the, on next later. Okay, that's electricity. Let's deal with electricity, though, a little simpler, since I don't play golf, and I think they actually make some golf clothes out of something that's not metal. But let's go to inside the house to conduct electricity. What conducts electricity? Copper, copper wire. Most of your wiring in your house is copper. Do we use wire to conduct electricity? Okay. So metals conduct heat and electricity. Tell me what they look like. Shiny. What was the fancy word you learned in school? They have what? Luster. luster. Good. They have luster. They're shiny. What else are they? Malleable. Malleable. Good job. You learned this, didn't you? Those fancy little words we learned in school. Malleable and what's the last one? Ductile. What's ductile mean? Can be drawn into a wire. Ductile means it can be made into a thin wire. Malleable means it can be shaped. So those are all the things that we've learned except for one last thing that you didn't even mention. What state do most um, metals have at room temperature? What's their state at room temperature for almost all of them? solid. Who's not? Okay. That's right. All are solid at room temperature except mercury. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature. Mercury is liquid. Mercury is a liquid. Everybody else is a solid at room temperature. All right. Now, don't put on nonmetals opposite. Put what their characteristics are. Start with conducting. Are they conductors? No. What is that called? They're good what? Say it. Insulators. They're good insulators of heat and electricity. They are not shiny, they are what? Dull. Say it again. Dull. dull, good job. They're dull. What else? They're not malleable and ductile, they are brittle. brittle. Good job. That's the word I have to pull teeth to get people to say. Brittle. They're brittle. What state are many of them in? Well, what are most of them? Say it. Good. Most are gases. Most are gas at room temperature. There is one liquid. Who is it? 
Nope, mercury's a metal. Bromine. 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 Bromine is liquid. And you do have some solids. Does anybody know who the solids are? Iron or no, we're talking non-metals, bud. We're talking non-metals. Carbon, Oxygen. phosphorus, sulfur. S listen to me. Carbon, phosphorus, sulfur, selenium, and iodine are solids. Carbon, phosphorus, sulfur, selenium, and iodine are solids. Bromine is a liquid, and then the rest are gases. And we're going to mark your periodic table so that you have this written in your periodic table. This is not like you, you're going to have a visual, so which will help you. Okay, but just so that you know and have it written. Metalloids have properties of both. Metalloids have properties of both metals and nonmetals. We say that they have intermediate properties. Oftentimes we'll say that term intermediate properties. Does so anybody know what some famous metalloids are? and what they're used for. Hmm? Aluminum is actually a metal. And I'll, we'll talk about where these are in a little bit on the periodic table. Aluminum is actually a metal, though. It's where the metalloids are, but it's the only one that sits there that's a true metal. Germanium is used as what? You may know. Germanium is a somewhat famous metalloid. Germanium and silicon are used as semiconductors. Where were they used, or where are they used as semiconductors? You might know? Electronics. Electronics. During COVID, do you know what happened with, so do you, maybe you're aware, maybe you're not aware, but during COVID, um, several of the car companies automobile manufacturers could not they could they could make the cars a lot of the parts but they could not get the computer chip you may remember that in fact it, there was a place in Kentucky I saw it when we were I was going to um, Cincinnati I can't remember where it is but there were there were just acres and acres of Ford trucks sitting there is that the race yes it was near the yes that's exactly right acres acres of trucks sitting there and it was like they were probably waiting for their computer chips because what was happening is is the computer chips could not get manufactured because what had to be one of the problems with it was the components that they needed to make the computer chips and one of those components is either silicon or germanium and where do you think that comes from the ground the ground that comes from the ground so what has to happen it has to be mind it has to be mined and then it has to be processed and and it has to be purified and then I mean it's a huge process to make these and so that was part of the problem the other thing that's kind of funny and you all may or may not even know this because you're you're young does anybody know the place that we call Silicon Valley where is Silicon Valley you may know where that is in California in California, Silicon Valley is in California. Now, why do we call it Silicon Valley? Does anybody know what is why the reason for that is? So the electronics. Where was Apple? Where did Apple start? Where did all of the electronics industry start? In California. And so they basically called that area, it was like the tech capital of the world when it started that's why they called it the Silicon Valley. That's where that came from. It had nothing to do with the amount of sand in the soil. It was because of computer chips. So it's kind of a funny thing. If you all are familiar with silicon being part of sand, 
then you're probably thinking that, right? And route. And some of you talked about silicon and glass and sand and glass and all that. That had nothing to do, though, with why they called it Silicon Valley. And it was because they used the that area was for the computer chips, and that's where they were making all of the electronics at the time, or most of them, the technology. All right, so let's look at another way to classify matter. And this, again, this is what we're going to spend a lot of time on, is how to classify matter. And so this is another way to classify matter. And so you can see here, matters at the top and we have several things underneath and so we're going to go through these and kind of talk about what these are so already today we have said matter can be elements and then we've classified elements further so we've actually gone here already and further classified elements how did we classify elements already metal non-metal metalloid right we already did that. How did we classify all matter already? Very first thing we did, solid, liquid, or gas, yes? Now we're saying, okay, we're gonna go back up to matter and we're gonna say matter, all matter is either a substance or a mixture. So what's a substance? A substance cannot be physically separated. A substance cannot be physically separated. It has a homogeneous composition. That means it's the same throughout. Homogeneous means the same throughout. So a substance cannot be physically separated. It has a homogeneous composition. It's the same throughout. There are only two things that can be substances, elements and compounds. Those are the only two things that can be substances. Elements and compounds are the only two things. Elements are the building blocks for all matter. And elements cannot be broken down by chemical means. Now, chemical is the key here. Some of you are saying, well, we can split an atom that's nuclear. Chemical and nuclear are, are different, and, the, and we're not even going to talk about nuclear in this class. You'll get that in 107. But Elements cannot be broken down by chemical means. You and I cannot go into a chemistry lab and break down an element. Elements are the building blocks for all matter. What are you composed of? Come on. Elements. You're composed of elements. You're composed of elements. You're more than that, but you are, that's what we have. That's why when people say, well, I don't even know anything about chemistry. You, well, you are chemistry. You are, that's what you are. You are chemistry, just like I am. Just like everything in this room is made up of elements. Everything. Everything in the world is made up of elements. That's matter, okay? Compounds are chemically combined elements. Compounds are chemically combined elements and they usually do not retain properties of individual elements. They usually do not retain the properties of the individual elements. So, sucrose, C12H22O11, is that a compound or an element? Sucrose is a compound. Sucrose is a compound. Iron, element. 
water compound. compound. Now, what if I said tap water? Tell me about tap water. What do I mean by tap water? Faucet water. That's what I mean. Comes out of the faucet. Is that a compound? Yes. No, it is not. I say it's, an it's not a compound and it is not an element. It is a mixture. Tap water is a mixture. Okay? So you have to pay attention to the words that we use. If it comes out of the faucet, water is not a compound. If I say to you pure water, or if I say to you H2O, or if I just say water, deionized water, distilled water, or just plain water, you have to make the assumption that I mean pure water. But if I mean the mixture that comes out of the faucet, that's called tap water. That's what I will call it. So pay attention to that, because that's something I may ask you, okay? Mixtures compared to substances can be physically separated. Can be physically separated. By the way, many of you don't know how to spell separate. I know this is stupid to even mention this, but it's an easy word to spell, and I learned it a long time ago. There is a rat in separate. How many of you put e rat? If you put e rat, it's a rat. There is a rat in separate. There's a rat in separate. So that'll help you remember that. So mixtures can be physically separated. Now, part of the problem with us talking about separation of mixtures and separation and physical separation is you don't know the different ways to separate. That's what the bottom part of this table, paper is going to be. So we'll get to that in a minute. But just for right now, mixtures can be physically separated. Substances cannot be physically separated. Mixtures also, compared to compounds, keep properties keep properties of individual substances. Keep properties of individual substances. You know this because if you have water and you add salt to it, what does this water taste like? Salt. If you have water and you add sugar to it, what's it taste like? Sugar. So did the sugar taste, did the sugar still keep its individual property? That's a physical. That's a physical mixture when it keeps the individual properties. If I put, um, let's say that I put iron with, um, let's just say I put, actually we'll talk about this too. Let's just say cereal, Cheerios, oatmeal, little packages of oatmeal. In that little package of oatmeal, and this is a test you can truly do, in a package of oatmeal in Cheerios that you buy in the grocery store, if you take Cheerios and pretty much any breakfast cereal and you crush it up, and, or take that oatmeal packet, and either one, take the oatmeal packet just like it is, take a Cheerios, crush them up a little bit, take any dry cereal like that, crush it up a little bit, put it on a paper plate or in a paper little bowl, little plastic bowl, take a magnet on the bottom of it. Take a magnet underneath that paper plate, and you start running that magnet around. And you run it around the bottom of that paper plate for a bit with the, either the Cheerios or the oatmeal, Keep doing it for just about a minute or so. Guess what you're going to find on the top of that plate? What's going to be moving with that magnet on top of that plate? What, what will stick to the magnet? Iron. Guess what's in the oatmeal that you and I eat and the cereal you and I eat? Iron. Actual iron. Not a compound of iron. Actual iron. If you don't believe me, do that little experiment. It's a fun little experiment to do. Why? Why can they put iron in our oatmeal or in our cereal 
How, I mean, that's like eating a nail. That's like taking an iron skillet and chipping it apart and putting it in your food. How can, why does that work? Why does that help us? Where does that food go? Where does that food go? Come on. In your stomach. What's in your stomach? Acid. Stomach acid is in your stomach called hydrochloric acid. Guess what hydrochloric acid and iron do? React. And that breaks that iron element down because that's literally iron element. So is the iron that's in your Cheerios, is that a mixture of iron in the Cheerios? Yes, that's a mixture of iron in the Cheerios. How do you know if the food you're eating has that kind of iron in it? Look at the box, look at the label, and it will say reduced iron. If it says reduced iron, then you know that's what it has in it. Reduced iron means iron in its elemental state. That's what that means. And you'll see that it's in cereal, it's in oatmeal, you'll see that it's in there. And that's why you can take the magnet and do that, because that's what's in it. So that is a mixture. Why? Because does the iron keep the property of iron? What's the property of iron that it kept? Come on, what can iron be done? What can, what can you do with iron in a magnet? Is a magnet attracted to iron? That's what I'm trying to get you to realize. Does a magnet get attracted to iron? So is that proof that the iron kept its individual property? Does that prove it's a mixture and not a compound? Do you see what I'm saying? Now, if iron was in a compound, as in a pill, like in a vitamin, then in that case, that iron is a compound. Will the, can you take a vitamin, crush it up, and put a magnet to it and find the iron in a vitamin? No, you can't. Why? Because it's a compound. So compounds don't retain their same characteristics. All right, two types of mixtures. What are they? I'm going to have to. I've got people snoozing on me. Wake up, guys. What are they? Homogeneous and heterogeneous. What's homogeneous mean? Same, Same throughout. Same throughout, meaning one phase, meaning one state. These may also be called solutions. May also be called solutions. So they're the same throughout. They may also be called solutions. Heterogeneous means different throughout. May be more than one phase. All right, give me an example of a homogeneous mixture. Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid, very good. What's another example of a homogeneous mixture? Sweet tea. Sweet tea, with ice or without? No ice. No ice. Sweet tea, no ice, just straight sweet tea. Now, what if we take ice and put it in that sweet tea? What do we have now? Heterogeneous. Do we have more than one phase? We got the solid ice and the sweet tea. Does that make sense? That's why. That's why. Even ice water. What's ice water? Heterogeneous. Ice water is heterogeneous. Now, where can I put tap water now? Just went through all that. Where am I going to put tap water? Homogeneous. Tap water, even if I write it H2O, tap water is still homogeneous. Tap water is still homogeneous, okay? What's a food that you eat that is a heterogeneous mixture? Lucky Charms, very good. Lucky Charms would be, very good. Lucky Charms would be a heterogeneous mixture, good. What's another one? Salad. Salad would be a heterogeneous mixture. What about tomato soup? 
be homogeneous. Tomato soup would be homogeneous. Unless you got chunks in your tomato soup. Homogeneous would be tomato soup. Vegetable soup would be heterogeneous. You see the difference? So baby food. What's baby food? Most I'm talking infant, infant baby food. Homogeneous. Applesauce. Homogeneous. You with follow? Does that make sense? Yep. The easiest way to think of these is if I had a big bowl of whatever it is I'm talking about and I took cups out of it, do I get exactly the same thing in every cup? And if it's not, then it's heterogeneous. That's what that means. That's basically what you're dealing with, okay? Now, we've got one extra word here before we get into the different ways of separating mixture. Alloys. What's an alloy? Very good. Homogeneous or heterogeneous? Homogeneous, that's exactly right. Alloys are homogeneous mixtures of metals. Tell me some examples of alloys. Steel, very good. What else? Ste say it again. Coil? Yeah. What do you mean? Like, like with a shock, like coil. Okay, that's steel usually, or it's, it's yes, it would be, you're right, steel coils, yes, springs, most of your springs are either, I mean, they, they would be similar to steel, not always. Think of other things, go off your phone, buddy, put it up, put it up. Tell me, I know this is not my most exciting lecture, okay? I get it. But if you need to be in your phone, hit the road. Come on, okay? All right, tell me what else. What are some other ones? What are some other examples of alloys that you've got in the real world? You use this every day. What do you eat with? What do you eat with? Silverware. Is it true silver? No. It's flatware, which is an alloy. Have you ever had, if you've had good flatware, high quality flatware, which is lots of times stainless or other things, is it heavy? Cheap flatware, though, is very light. What they have in the, in the DSU is going to be really cheap, light flatware. But is that still an alloy? Yeah, so your flatware is going to be an alloy. What about jewelry? Are you wearing 100% pure gold jewelry? No. Now, if you can cut your ring open and it's got a layer on the outside and something else on the inside, that means it's not an alloy. It means it's cheap plated stuff. Yeah, probably. But if it's the same throughout, what does that mean? It's an alloy. So your jewelry, your jewelry, most of your jewelry is an alloy. What about the things that lamps are made out of? Some lamps, what are they made out of? Katie, wake up. What are some lamps made out of? BR, BR, two different ones. So you've got, what have we got, huh? Brass. brass, have you heard of brass? What's the other BR word that's an alloy? Bronze, very good. Brass and bronze, brass and bronze, brass and bronze. Okay, all right, keep going now. Let's talk about ways to separate mixtures. You guys are bored, so show me you know what you're talking about here. Show me that you know the physical methods of separating mixtures. What are they? There's about, I've got about seven or eight, ten maybe written down here. What are some ways to separate mixtures? Um, I want to come back to that one. Because I'm, let's come back, that's a little more complicated, so hold on on that one. Evaporation. Evaporation, what goes along with that? What's the big word that goes in front of that that includes evaporation? Evaporation is definitely part of it. What is evaporation and condensation? What's the word that includes evaporation and condensation? Distillation. Distillation. Distillation is a physical method of separating a mixture. What does it do? It uses heat to evaporate. And we could just stop there, but it also uses condensation to gather what evaporated. 
And that's why I wanted you to use both, not just evaporation, but also condensation. So it uses heat to evaporate, then condensation to collect the gas. Now, would distillation be used for a homogeneous or a heterogeneous mixture? Homogeneous. You would use distillation for a homogeneous mixture. You would not use that for a heterogeneous mixture. You could, you could use it for heterogeneous, but that would be an awful lot of waste of energy. This is a setup for distillation. I want to show you this just real quickly. This is a simple chemistry distillation setup. So you have the flask where you're boiling your liquid and the liquid evaporates. Why are we checking the temperature of it? What's the point of distillation? The point of distillation is to get one thing separated from another. Could this be used for two liquids? Could it also be used for a solid in a liquid? Could be used for either one. Could be used for either one of these two things. What do you try to get to the boiling point of? One of the substances, but not both, if it's two liquids. Does that make sense? Where have you heard distillation used in? Moonshine. Moonshine. That's where most people hear it. That's right. Making moonshine. And they think, many people without knowing, think making moonshine means distillation. Or distillation means making moonshine. What is the process of distillation doing in the making of moonshine or any alcohol? What is the process of distillation doing? Is that the making of the alcohol? No, what makes the alcohol? Fermentation, Fermentation makes the alcohol. The making of alcohol is a chemical reaction using yeast and sugars and fermenting that gets you the actual alcohol. What is distillation? What, what is that part of it? Why do we distill alcohol? Purify it. Purify it. If we want straight moonshine, which is as pure alcohol as we can get, we want to really make it pure alcohol, and we can't ever get it 100% pure, but the more we distill it and the better we are at distilling, will that make the alcohol more pure? Back in the 40s, during the war, in, the, in the, both wars, well, especially in World War II, you may have heard people that are older talk about they would actually run automobiles on moonshine. How would they do that? Because what was the moonshine, if they purified it well enough, what could they get? A really, really good what mixture? Alcohol. Does alcohol burn? And they ran there, and we're not talking about a new car today. We're talking about the old cars of then. And they could run their car on alcohol. If they had a fuel ration, but they could make moonshine, then they could actually run their car on alcohol. But what did it take in order to do that? If you've got two liquids, liquid alcohol, ethanol, and water, which one is going to have a higher boiling point? Do you have to know the boiling point of both? Yes or no? Do you have to know the boiling point of both? Yes. Which one would have the higher boiling point? Water. Water has the higher boiling point. Alcohol is going to boil first. So will you let this, if this were alcohol and water, ethanol and water, this was, you had filtered, which is another word we're going to use. You had filtered all your mash. You had filtered everything else out of your moonshine. And all you had left was the liquid, but it contained water and alcohol, and you needed to separate it out. Are you going to let this temperature get up to 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the boiling point of water? If you do, what happens? The water evaporates. What are you going to try to keep the temperature of this? The boiling point of who? Alcohol. You're going to try to keep it to be the boiling point of alcohol. If you do that, then what's going to come out as your distillate over here? Alcohol. And so what they would do is they would run it through their still, 
once, and then they'd run this back through, and they would watch the temperature even closer. Now, did they have their, was there still a glass tube with a water jacket? Where were all of the stills located? Near a what? Creek. creek. Near a creek. Why were they near a creek? What was their tube? Copper tubing. You've seen this in the movies. You've seen this. Was it a tube of copper? Was it this coil of copper? And what, where was that coil of copper going to be placed? Either in the water so that it would keep it cooler faster, or even if it wasn't in the water, that continual coil did that help cool it. Now, when you think about that today, go to real world for a minute. Where do we have coils that help cool things in the real world today? Air conditioners, refrigerators. Are we still radiators? You with me? Are we still using the same philosophy in a sense? So all of these concepts kind of pull together if you start thinking, oh, that's what they did here. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar. And so I want you to start thinking about that. Putting things together is so important with this. So that goes back to all of the concepts we're talking about. Evaporation, which you mentioned, evaporation. But in this case, we're not just letting it go out into the air. We're catching the condensate, and then the condensate is collected as the distillate. And so that's process of distillation. I used another word. What was the other one? Filtration. So filtration is going to be used for what? What kind of mixtures? Heterogeneous mixtures. Heterogeneous mixtures. In other words, do you have to have a particle that will be collected in a filter paper? Yes or no? Yes, you got to have, so muddy water, can you filter muddy water? Yes, you can filter muddy water. You can fil what about coffee, making coffee, aren't you using filter paper? Sweet tea, fil coffee tea bags, okay? F oil filter, you're filtering out all the pieces of metal, <coughs> dirt, etc. in your oil filter. Very good, yes. All right. A sieve or sift. Anybody work on the Western's farm where they make mulch and compost? Sieve or a sift? S-I-E-V-E. -E. What do they do? They make compost or mul and mulch on Western's farm. What do they run that through? After it's composted for a while, what are they going to run it through? Do, when you get compost from a like Mighty Mulch or one of these mulch places, when you get mulch or compost, do you want big pieces of wood in it? That's how they're making it. They're making it with wood. They chip it up, but sometimes the chipper messes up or they throw things in it you don't want in there. What do they need to do? And most of the time they do. I know Western's Farm used to do it. Joey out there used to do this all the time. What did they run it through? A sieve. What's a sieve? Think of a screen. Think of a screen. A big screen and the small particles go through and we're talking this one would have fairly good sized holes guys would the compost sieve have a big as big of holes as the mulch sieve no the compost sieve would be smaller holes than the mulch sieve but should you get big pieces of wood should you even get a piece of wood the size of this project or the camera no you shouldn't get water bottle sized pieces of woods in your mulch if they're running it through the sieve and their sieve doesn't have holes in it. So those are things that, is that another way of separating? Is that a mixture? Is compost a mixture? Mulch a mixture? Sure it is. And so that's another way of separating. If you've ever cooked much, back in the day, a long time ago, when people had more bugs in their house, bugs would get into the flour. Why did people sift flour back then? To get the bugs out. That, and they would use a sieve, exactly, for, make, for um, panning for gold. When you ever heard that for panning for gold? That exactly, it was a sieve. It was a sieve. It's exactly what they were doing, panning for gold. Good. 
So again, heterogeneous mixtures. Heterogeneous mixtures. All right, um, magnetism. Magnetism, I've already talked about magnetism. What would magnetism be used for, heterogeneous or homogeneous? Iron-containing heterogeneous, good. Iron-containing heterogeneous. Centrifugation, does anybody know what centrifugation means? Spinning. spinning, fast spinning. Fast spinning. Anybody know what gets centrifuged in the real world, especially in agriculture and in medicine? What gets centrifuged to separate it? Blood, very good. It's fast spinning to settle solids that's what it is it's similar <coughs> excuse me it's similar to filtration it's fast spinning to settle the solids and it's going to be for homogeneous mixtures and blood is centrifuged if you've ever given double red when you give blood at the american red cross if you've ever given double red or ever seen somebody back there on a machine when you're giving blood and they actually are hooked up to a machine and their blood goes out of their arm into the machine, it spins it and they take out only the red blood cells and then they put back in their white blood cells in their plasma. And so they're only taking the, blood, the red blood cells. You can also go to Nashville and, and um, to the Red Cross and other places too and you can get platelets. Cancer patients need, a, leukemia patients need a lot of platelets. They can do the same thing by taking out only your platelets and that's all done with the centrifuge. What in the real world in agriculture is centrifuged? Jews in AI. What's AI, artificial intelligence? No, not in this case. Artificial insemination, what's centrifuged? What's centrifuged? Come on, somebody knows this. Semen. The semen is centrifuged. The semen is centrifuged sometimes. Not in always, but if you buy semen, very likely that, if you buy sperm or buy semen, oftentimes that has been centrifuged. Why do they want to send everything? What are you really interested in? The whole seminal fluid or just the sperm? Just the sperm. And so lots of times semen will be centrifuged. That's what they will do with semen. They will centrifuge it. So blood, semen, those are two things that are oftentimes centrifuged. All right. You mentioned one. I want to throw it on here. And you said melting. I'm going to put, we're going to write this one, and then we're going to come back to a couple more, and I'll bring some periodic tables for Thursday. Temperature differences. You mentioned melting. I'm going to put down temperature differences, and I'm literally going to put boiling, freezing, melting. I'm going to put those states. Tell me an example in real life in the kitchen where you have a mixture and you are separating it with a temperature difference. Say it again. Okay, you're cooking off the water. That's one I would not have thought of. You are cooking. Anytime you cook meat, you're cooking off the water. Let's go, let me go, let's go cooked meat. Let's go cooked meat. You made a Boston butt. You cooked it for supper last night. You left it in the pan. You don't want to go through and debone it. You want to have it tomorrow. So you go back the next day. You get it out of the refrigerator. Tell me what that pan looks like. What's it got on top? fat. It's got fat on top. What's underneath the fat? The meat and what else? The juice. Did you just separate a mixture of fat and juice? How did you do it? Look, right here. Temperature difference. Which one will freeze or solidify at the refrigerator temperature? The water, the juice, or the fat? Is, is that a way to separate it? That's a way to separate. You would never thought of that. That was a way to separate it, though, okay? All right, we're going to come back here. Guys, a couple of you are going to have to get off your phones in class, okay? 
I know I'm not the most exciting some days, but get off your phones and stay awake, okay? I will bring a periodic table on Thursday.